first off, it's good to be <clears throat> with everyone. And um, I, I know a ton of you that are on this call. If I don't know you, hopefully we'll get the, the opportunity. And, I, you know, Randy, we haven't even had a chance to, to, to sit down in I don't know how long. So I'm looking forward to whenever that next coffee is. Um, so this, you know, <clears throat> in essence, this could be like, uh, like our little, little coffee talk, if that's what we want to call it, with, um, with about 25 boxes of people just, um, <clears throat> just hanging in there. I wanted to let everybody know um, a, a little bit of, <clears throat> of what's been going on. And, um, and I'm not even sure, Randy, if, um, you know, if you wanted to, me to share any of, any of my slides. I don't have that <clears throat> sharing ability right now. I can if you want. If not, no big deal. But I'll give you guys a little bit of an idea of, of sort of my pivot. I, I did a little bit of a, um, um, you know, LinkedIn post about that a few weeks ago, kind of playing off of the PPP thing. I mean, there, you, know, you could talk about right now needing positivity more than ever, needing passion for what you're doing. But one of the things that I've been talking about <clears throat> and channeling uh, a little bit of the late David Glass, who was one of the, one of the best people that I've met uh, in, in my 25 years in sports. You, sometimes I would hear from fans, well, we don't, you know, he's not around. We don't know him much. It was by design. I mean, he, he very intentionally never wanted the spotlight to be about him. And, and this was the guy that took Walmart <clears throat> to another level. This is a guy that um, kept the Royals going strong in Kansas City. And yes, there were a lot of rough times, but ultimately <laughs> brought them back to a championship. This guy loved baseball more than really anybody that I would, was around, have been around in my 12 years in Kansas City. Uh, he just didn't tell you about it. And you had to ask. And we'd see him a lot at the ballpark. <clears throat> of all the times I talked to him, of all the times that I interviewed him, I, I never once heard him say the words I or me. Never did. It was always about everyone else. And so mm -hmm. he, he <clears throat> in his final interview, uh, with us, which I think might have been his final interview ever. It was the, the final Saturday of September of this past year. And we were able to track him down for an interview. Um, and it was going to be his final interview, at least as we, we knew as Royals owner. And, um, you know, he was great. He, he looked frail. He didn't, you know, he didn't look so good, but he, he assured me that he was fine. Um, he obviously, as many of you know, ended up passing away a few months later. But he said, it's all about the people. It's always about people. And that's that other P word. He said, you, you, don't, you don't accomplish anything in life. I'm paraphrasing here. But you don't accomplish anything in life on your own. You do it with people. And here's a guy that, you know, I, I've thought about this a lot lately. Especially early on during this pandemic in the, quarant in the quarantine, people were figuring out how to get their groceries and how to get their food. And if, if you were serious about staying in, and we were, um, I know for us early on, we weren't ready to go into a grocery store yet. And so we were doing our curbside pickup orders from Walmart. And a grocery store in a Walmart, however many years ago, would have been a foreign concept. That was his concept. This guy was, was brilliant. He was passionate. But more than anything, it was about people. And, you know, I see a lot of amazing networkers on this call right now. And so many of you, first off, if you know Randy, then you understand that. Um, and, and I won't rattle off name after name, but, but you know, you look at connectors like Frank Benura on here. It's all about people. I mean, and, and this has been, to me, reinforced during this time right now because I'm seeing people go one of two ways. I'm seeing the, well, I, this isn't the same. I can't sit down with someone. This Zoom thing is different. It's just not like shaking a hand. And that, that to me... You know, Chase knows this as a former athlete. Like, you, either you do it or you don't. You know, you either run through that wall or you stop. And so things are different now. And to me, many of us, um, I see at least the, 
uh, the Andy Rieger name at the bottom there. And in, in my speech right now, he's, uh, I, I include pieces of his interview with me on my podcast. You want to talk about one of the great pivots, and there's one of those P words. It's, it's Rieger going from whiskey to hand sanitizer <clears throat> and what they've learned about that along the way. But it all starts with people. And so I, I can't go um, for, for coffee with Linda to her place right now. That'll come soon. But there's still the ability to connect. So I look at this, and I will also channel here the words of Kathy Nelson of the Kansas City Sports Commission, who was on my podcast a few weeks ago. And she used a quote that is now part of every speech that I'm doing certainly virtually, and it might be there at the end. Uh, and the quote was from Billie Jean King, that pressure is a privilege. And so I've talked about this a lot, how many of us right now are under pressure? If you're not, I'd love to sign up for what you got going on. But if you are under pressure, and we all are in some form or another, I, I, I can't possibly understand at the level she did the pressure of ca having to cancel the Big 12 tournament. $20 million of economic impact lost. Everybody, if you can go back to the middle of March, all anyone said, I just, just, I don't care about anything. Just make sure we have the NCAA tournament. I, wh whatever happens, just make sure we get to go to the Big 12. In the moment, people just wanted to go do the things that were fun to them. And, and for those of us that are sports fans, uh, that's one of the things we look forward to to get us away from life. For me, I, I help bring that to people. But as Kathy told me afterwards, she said weeks later, it seemed like such a small decision. But in the moment, it seemed like the world was riding on her shoulders. And so, you know, as she said, you start thinking about the, the servers at Johnny's and all the different people that are going to be affected economically by the cancellation of that tournament. Afterwards, and she said during... She found herself saying, pressure is a privilege. So I, when she told me that, because if uh, I'll tell you guys all my situation, I'm, I'm a, uh, as many of you know, and if, if you don't, uh, hopefully you'll watch this year. Uh, I, I'm a baseball announcer. I get paid by the game. So my last regular paycheck came like October 6th or whatever the first Friday of October was of last year. I was ready for that first paycheck to come, which would have been, uh, the first first Friday of April. We were opening on March 26th. It's obviously now late May, and I, I, I think that that might happen, you know, sometime in July. So, and, and oh, by the way, I had this speaking business. Um, nobody's getting on a stage right now. So there are one of two ways you can go here. I mean, you could sit there and wait, or you could take action. One of the things that I've been telling all my attendees in my different events is to take, to take messy action. So many of us right now, or always for that matter, and it's helped to make us successful, so many of us are perfectionists. But as Drew Meyer, which would tell you from, you know, his days over uh, in the military and Somalia and, and all the different conflicts he was involved in, nothing ever goes to plan. Maybe every now and then, right, Drew? You can nod yes or no, or or, or tell me your. You can give me that look, like you know Goldberg's completely crazy. Uh, most of us have not been in actual warfare like that. Uh, I I know I see a few on here that have. That's life and death. But I, I this is one of the reasons why. And 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 Randy tells the stories of so many military people so well. This is why the military to me are the best guests and people that I talk to in terms of leadership because they have lived that leadership in life and death circumstances. Much different than sports. However, and Chase could tell you this, a baseball player could tell you this, you know, when 100 miles an hour is coming at you towards your head, it may not be quite like the battlefield, but you got to make a decision. And it may not be exactly what you expected. That's where we're at right now. Uh, one of the one of, one of the analogies that, that I've used is, is hopping on a sailboat, you know, the, a big fancy sailboat and, and having the captain take that from, say, San Francisco to Tokyo. 
and you got your your path chartered out you're not just going to blindly do this and then inevitably the storms come that that's where we're at right now we're in a pandemic storm we're not just going to keep going straight ahead it's not as clean as we thought it would be so you got to navigate it sometimes you're navigating it with your eyes closed but when i say taking messy action what what i mean is that you know it's um you may not be comfortable with it. So try some things. I, I don't like the whole stay in your lane thing, but I do think you need to stay in your lane in terms of being true to who you are. So I've tried different things and I'll, Randy, I'll kick it over to, to you here in a, a couple of minutes and we can chat, but you know, I, I, I couldn't sit around and wait for baseball. So just to update everybody on what happened with me, and I'd started a podcast two and a half years ago. It was every other week that it became weekly, interviewing different entrepreneurs and business people uh, in town about leadership and culture, all the topics I talk about to corporations. And that, that went from every other week to weekly, and, and I had about eight episodes recorded. Took a month off and was ready to, to start a new season to coincide with baseball. And then the pandemic hit, and I'm thinking, I got the CEO of Burns and McDonald. I got the chief marketing officer of, of Hallmark, on and on. And I didn't ask any of them about leadership during these times. We didn't know that it was existing yet. So what else could we do? So, you know what? I'm going to start a daily video podcast. I don't even, I don't know when this all started, whatever that was, 10 weeks ago? 12, I, I don't even know. But today will be episode 44. Monday through Friday, five days a week, video interviews. Aaron Folk can tell you all about the importance of content. Now, suddenly, I'm talking to leaders every single day, 25 minutes, 30 minutes, 50 minutes, all different types about their stories. And, oh, by the way, it feels good to be able to help potentially promote someone. The challenge, and I'll take any advice on it, is I'm having to learn how to say no because uh, I'm getting – messages every single day now from people saying could we come on your show and i'm trying to figure out what the purpose is in each one and what the story is beyond just the the simple promotion um he, here's a hint starting a a uh, linkedin private message with someone that you don't know with hey man um that usually doesn't work too well i'm not asking for sir either i, I i'll i'll say this you know when, when i started with it's all about people and I'm guessing that everyone on this on this call already knows this, because if you're affiliated in some way with Randy, and I, I just know the caliber of people on here, but it's amazing to me how many people have forgotten to act like people during this. Uh, my friend Andre Davis the other day, uh, I think this was Tuesday, I had him on my show. Anybody that knows Andre um, could tell you that he's in construction with built interiors, but really you would say, I'm not really sure exactly what industry he's in. He's in the people industry. He, he had a great comment. He said, how, how come sometimes people will go for coffee once and then feel like they need to propose with the ring? He, he wouldn't go on one date and propose. And Andre says, I, I sometimes don't even bring up to the person I'm meeting for coffee what I do until two or three times in. If it doesn't come up, it doesn't come up. I mean, he said to me the other day that he was talking to someone that he had business scheduled. And he said, you know, how are things looking? And the person said, you know, not sure that we want to do a project as big anymore. We may not need that kind of office space. And his response was, you know what, if you want to do smaller, I totally support it. And if you need to go a different direction with someone else, I'll help you with that too. I said, they'll come back to you. Uh, at a time where we're all under so much pressure and, and you're going to support that. I mean, I think we need more of that. So Anyway, that's a little bit of, of what I'm talking about. And I, I think I, I, I think I was on in some form or another five or six different speeches or presentations this week. And uh, I, I never envisioned in my wildest dreams that I would be presenting to organizations and groups via computer. But you know what? It's, I, I refuse to say it's worse. It's just different. It, it's just different or as as Dan Stolp, who many of you may know and Sandler training and sales said on my show he's like he doesn't believe in that it is what it is which by the way no one has ever said the expression it is what what it is with a positive spin he said it's not it is what it is it just is this is just the way it is and we don't know exactly what the new normal look like 
but you know what? I, I, um, I, I'm, I'm sitting in a walk-in closet right now and I'll do my podcast later. I'm talking to different groups and, and you know what? I may be sitting in this walk-in closet when baseball starts too. I don't know. Um, but I'll be ready to go. So, uh, I, I think it's, um, I think it's a great opportunity for all of us to get back to, to what Kathy Nelson said, pressure is a privilege. As soon as I realized that, uh, and those words from Billie Jean King, I, I realized that there's such an opportunity here. You know, the tendency in time of crisis with a lot of managers and business leaders is to rearrange the deck chairs. Things are bad, so I got to change the team. I got to reorganize. I got to restructure. I got to do something different because I can't just sit around yeah, you've had a lot of powerful stories about patience and believing in the team and believing in the program. Yeah, how do, how do you translate that to business and how do you how do you know when I should make change and when is the right time to believe in the process and give it a little more time? Well, I, I think that if your process was good to start with, it should stay. And process to me in many ways is your culture. If you're first having to because the best companies right now aren't reinventing who they are. They might be reinventing how they go about things. They might be reinventing how they have to communicate with people. Um, the good ones, the best ones are communicating now more with their people than what they were before. The, the ones that struggle on that end, here's one that I've heard. Well, we didn't really have anything to update you on, so we'll get back to you when we do. And then people sit there and they're waiting and they're wondering. I've heard that one a lot versus let's get on a quick call and just let you know what's going on. Hey, we don't have a ton going on, but as soon as we knew, we do blah, blah, blah. I don't think we have to reinvent ourselves. I think we just have to reinvent if needed, how we're going about things. And then obviously everybody's got their decisions to make from a financial standpoint. Can I keep everyone? Can I not? Um, Andrew Dallas, the CEO of Pro Athlete, said on my, my show recently, he said, look, you know, if, if you have this amount of PPP money and you know you're going to be able to keep everybody this long, then let them know we're going to keep everybody this long and we'll reevaluate and let them know we're going to reevaluate when that, when that happens. So I, I know from, from my standpoint personally, while, while having missed out now on probably something like 50-something games so far, um, you know, I, I'm going to end up on a personal level, losing at least 50% of my salary this year. So let's move on. Uh, I'm not going to change who I am, but I've got to reinvent the way I go about things. And so I, I do think that the companies that have good cultures, that have those values, uh, they're going to stick to that. They should be sticking to those because I think that's what's going to pull everybody through. I don't know if that answers that or not, Randy. Yeah, I think that's, uh, that's great advice. Setting aside the money element, between being a sportscaster and being a storyteller on topics of leadership and culture, um, which one gets your juices flowing the most? That's a phenomenal question. I, I do like them equally both. It's different. Um, there's, I, I don't, I think I would, I, I would, I don't want to say I'd be lost, but I would be disappointed to not have either of them. And they do have a different feel to them. Um, and I've actually thought about this a little bit lately. And, and for those of you that are on, you know, Zoom calls, and we all are in some form or another, um, I'll, I'll give this little tidbit or piece of advice. It may or may not be relatable, but in the TV world where I love talking about baseball, but really it's not baseball, it's storytelling. So, I mean, the, the real answer, Steve, is that I get a chance to be a storyteller in both. But the format was different for me before. I mean, before, when you're at the stadium, you know, you do see all the fans and all that. On the road, people don't really know who you are. Uh, I've had a lot of nights where a game ends at 1 or 2 in the morning and they're shutting out the lights in the stadium and it's just me on the field or me and Jeff Montgomery. Um, you're looking into a camera. And you don't even see these little boxes of who's looking at you. So there was always a different feel being on stage where you're reading body language and you're feeding off of an audience. And to me, mentally, and this is the advice, even if you've never been in front of a television camera, is I, I, I'm viewing these virtual calls just like I would be on a TV broadcast. And so 
you have to, especially on those where you don't see the boxes and the faces like I'm seeing right now. And I started thinking, I don't want to embarrass her, but I did a call, uh, a speech last Friday for ACG Kansas City. And you couldn't see one person that was on there except for the organizer. But Linda had already texted me. And, and, I, and I know Linda's personality. So I just knew that any line that I delivered that I thought would get a smile from her, like the, the beautiful smile that you're seeing right now, um, I'd, I'd picture it. And I would feed off of that. So in some ways, Steve, that to me is fun because it's a new challenge. Like, how do I make this work? Um, I miss being at baseball. I'm sure my family misses me being at baseball because they're not programmed for me to have been home for eight straight months every single day. Um, but I'm energized by the new challenge. So if I had to pick, I would hope not to. We had a question here from the chat. Um that I loved. How did you get to be so awesome? Were you born like that? Or did it take years of work? <laughs> um, it, but, you know, even, yeah, you know, that did make me think, you know, um, what's the Joel Goldberg kid story? When did you know you wanted to be a broadcaster? How, how did you end up on this journey? You know, I, I would, um, I would not say that I was born awesome, but I was, <laughs> but I, but I was born um, and had great parents and, um, you know, they, they taught me uh, the work ethic. I, I always saw that. And, you know, we, we grew up middle-class neighborhood, um, m moved from Philadelphia to Chicago when I was 13 to a very wealthy area. Uh, we weren't wealthy, uh, but my parents, I think they just looked and saw who's got, where's the best school district? We'll go there. And so, you know, we were, we were in one of the best, um, school districts in the state of Illinois, um, minus some of the um, abundance of wealth, or well, we had the we were the minus. Everybody else seemed to be the plus. Um, but what I saw from my parents every day was um, uh, I'll, I'll share. I think a couple people have heard this. My my mom's story is actually incredible. My dad was in um, marketing, so he, um, he he was in marketing for a really what was like a, a chemical company. Uh, a lot of trade magazine type of stuff and all that. Um, so, but it was very corporate. And um, my mom was a music teacher. She was a, a music major. And before I was born, she was teaching high school music. And then when my brother and I were born, um, she, you know, she was doing piano lessons and things like that. And as we started to get a little bit older, old enough that I can remember having to tag along with her a couple of times, she went back to community college and, um, and got a degree as a, as a computer programmer. It, Back then, you didn't call it coding, but that's essentially what she was doing. And she started working for a guy. Um, and, and then we moved to Chicago for my dad's job. And, and she climbed, she got a job with another company and climbed the ranks. Eventually, that company was bought by um, others and then Bank of America. And it, it was a company that um, trading stocks and bonds. And she was doing the programming. By the end, she was like an upper level management and executive with hundreds of people on her team. Very successful. Um, executive. I watched my parents every day, uh, you know, as we were in high school, they, they were gone, but before we woke up, I don't know who got us up. I mean, they were on a train down to downtown Chicago at six in the morning and coming home at six or seven at night. I, I didn't know any other way than that's how you worked. So um, the born awesome, yeah, my, I mean, my mom would probably say yes. Um, but I, I had the background of seeing the way to do things and there was no TV background. Um, the other thing, so I knew early on, I, I would say maybe even as early as first or second grade, I wanted to be on TV doing this. I drove my teachers crazy every morning. You know, we didn't have obviously internet or anything like that. So I came in with whatever the box score was from the night before. And I talked about it over and over and over and over and over again. So I had the passion for that. Um, and then I, I just, this is what I was going to do. I've told the story before, but I got out of college and you know, we didn't have internet. We didn't have YouTube links to send. We had actual tapes that you had to make and put a fancy label on or what you thought was a fancy label from like a word processor or I don't know, and you'd, you'd mail it. And you'd hope that, you, you, you'd hope that, um, that they watched. Uh, and nobody was watching. And it was just rejection, rejection. So I started cold calling people. I'm not a cold caller. And I started driving around the country and just, just knocking on doors, essentially saying, hey, if, if you're there next Wednesday, I'm passing through Terre Haute. 
could I stop in? I wasn't going to Terre Haute. As soon as they told me that they'd be there, I'd stop in, I'd, I'd, I'd shake a hand. Uh, and suddenly I went to the front of the line. Hey, Joel, this is Drew. <clears throat> I know you, you, you scratched on something that one of the most impressive things you've talked to me about um, is values. Um, and obviously in a, in a period of adversity, I would argue the only thing that gets an organization through um, adversity is values. Um, Jack Welsh talks about performance um, and integrity or values. You've used that multiple times in your culture uh, classes. I, I'm sure most people in here have heard that, but of all of the things that you have seen during this, is there examples, both positive and negative, in terms of why the values have either succeeded or failed uh, in some of the organizations that you're trying to help? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think, and I'll get back, Drew, to, to again, one being who you are. And, and I'll go back and set this up with, with a um, Joe Madden quote or soundbite that I use a lot. And Joe Madden, you know, he'll forever be known as the, the guy to, to take the Cubs to a world championship for the first time in 100 years. And three years later, they've moved on in a different direction because that's how fickle baseball can be. So he's at some point he'll be the new, well, he is the new manager of the Los Angeles Angels. He's one of the most interesting, introspective guys that I know. Uh, but he told me a few years back, I said to him, I mean, you and I have had some discussions like this too. Um, I said, you know, I talk a lot about culture and trust. How do you build trust? And he stopped me there and he said, you know, he talked about the steps. He said, you can't build trust until you build the relationship. So we all want to go build trust. And so, you know, when, I, when you ask about like successes right now, I think the companies that are thriving or at least surviving are the ones that had already built that trust. You can't say, let's build that trust today. And it doesn't happen overnight. Uh, you and I have that trust, right? Linda and I have that trust. Randy and I have that trust. Um, I can, can name off others on this call. Why do we have that trust? Because we built the relationship. So the relationship comes first. As Joe Madden told me, then the trust follows. Once you have the trust, and Drew, you know this in leading troops out, you know, out there in the field. Um, and they don't all have to like you, by the way, either. Um, but you have to have some form of a relationship. And I know that there's, you, you, you know, there's protocol and hierarchy and all that type of stuff or, or um, whatever the word is. But um, once you have that trust, he says, then and only then can you have the ability to exchange ideas. Once you exchange those ideas, that constructive criticism can flow. But if I tune in, jump in here right now, um, and say to Adam, um, hey, I think you should, although I, I want to credit Adam, he has asked if he could come on my business or come on my program, promote his business, and will uh, you be my client now that we're friends, man? Um, I love that. Um, I, love the, I love the humor there, picking, uh, picking up where I left off. But um, I wouldn't expect any of you to trust me, even maybe having seen me on TV before. Aaron Falk and I have that, but it came from building a relationship um, and then a trust that enables me to um, to make fun of her from time to time when um, when I like to do that. Sorry, don't you're not allowed to unmute yourself. Um, I love you, but um, you know that. True, what I'm seeing right now is that the companies that had that figured out are the success stories. Um, if any of you know Chris Giuliani, who's the CEO of Spring Venture Group. 15 people in the company when he started in 2011, they're around 900. And I think I saw something on LinkedIn this morning that they were promoting that they're hiring. They, they were able to pivot, get everybody home and thrive immediately. But before we knew that this was a pandemic, he was one of those recorded podcasts that I had before this all started. Um, he, he had talked about the open door policy. And by the way, the open door policy doesn't work if you haven't built the relationship and the trust. What, what employee is gonna go into their employer's office if they don't trust them in some form or another? Hey, my door's open. Well, I, I don't know if what I say is gonna be safe or not. But, but Chris said for years, they've had this policy of 
reaching out to their people and saying, what do you need? What do you better need to do your job? So they had already built that. So when he told me that they were able to seamlessly move home, and yes, they've got all the technical staff to help with that, um, they've been extremely productive. And then, and I spoke to their group briefly, their, their leadership team a few weeks ago. They are putting out multiple videos per week, updating their folks of what was going on. And then they were sending surveys. And then they would do a video update, answering questions on those surveys, over communicating. And I'll just get back to, I mean, the ones that have struggled are, are the ones that have forgotten or, or never had that ability. I don't know if that answers everything or not, but I, I think that, that this pandemic here right now is separated. It's separated people. I'll get back to that call. Well, we don't have anything to update you on right now. Translation, we'll get back to you when we can. And that doesn't work. Um, hi, Joel. Hi, it's hi Maddie. Maddie. Here. It's good to see you. Um, I'm curious about what is the most unexpected or what has surprised you the most about this pandemic in, um, in anything? What surprised you the most? Great question. Um, I know the, I'll go the opposite end first. The part that hasn't surprised me gets back to the people. I, I, I always knew that there were a lot of good people that, that, got it out there. I, I think one thing I could say again is it, it has surprised me how much people have forgotten to act decent and normal. And, um, and it's not like, it's not like people are blowing up my inbox or whatever. Um, I'm being rude, but it's just amazing how much common sense in the midst of panic. I'll get back to you military guys out there. Um, you know, you're in the middle of all that fire. You can't panic. You got to trust your instincts. And I, I, it's, so I guess that surprised me a little bit about how many people have gotten away from themselves. But I, I think the biggest thing that surprised me is how, and I'm not just talking about speaking, but how doable all of this is still via computer. I don't know that it's healthy to be staring into this green dot for eight hours a day. Um, I mean, I've had days like that and, you, you know, you walk away, like I, I got to get out of here for a little bit. Um, so, you know, it, it's, but I, I've thought about this a lot. I mean, and, uh, and I'm not going to go with the, you're so young thing, but you don't remember a time when there was no internet, Maddie. Right. And, um, and, and then some of us remember, remember. what it was like without, oh, stop it. Um, come on. I, I remember, let's put it this way. Um, I mean, I remember when email was just starting and we had to go to the library in college to use it. Um, my point, I, I mean, I'm not picking on you, I, but my point is like the world changes. So, you know, there, there, there's a Simon Sinek talk out there right now, um, which sort of messes a little bit with one of the first slides of my presentation because I call it unprecedented times. Very original. I know everybody's talking unprecedented times. And Simon Sinek said these aren't unprecedented times. But he did essentially go and say what, what I agree with here. Um, it, it's not unprecedented in the sense that we've had major disruption in this, com in this country before. And not just 9-11, but, but the, in the invention of the internet changed the way we went about things. I found my blockbuster card when we were cleaning stuff out six weeks ago. I kept it as a, as a token, as a memento. Blockbuster, if they had decided to go the streaming route, would still be a thing. What are cab companies going to look at, look like in the future? Because they've struggled to keep up with Uber. So I, I think, you know, to me, the biggest surprise and I don't know exactly what it looks like, is almost feeling like we're watching what the future might look like or glimpses of it right before our eyes. I mean, I'm watching you do art and classes on video. You know, like, like people can watch Maddie and I, I, can't, I can't draw anything, so I, I, I would be hopeless, but um, people actually can, like, can learn and work on that craft just by watching her and not even needing to be in person. I, I think that's been the biggest surprise to me. And, and I guess, again, it gets back to a little bit of, um, you know, instead of saying, why can't we do it? What, what can we do? Hey, we've got a question on here from um, 
Chantel, and, and most people don't know her, but she's a super talented songwriter in Nashville and been a friend for a number of years. And, and I actually plan to feature some of the things she's doing cool. here soon because uh, she's got some neat projects going on. But uh, her question is, have you experienced any kind of increase or change in creativity during this period? Yeah, I think I, I, I have. I, I would um, be really interested, um, Chantel, on, on how that's changed for an artist. Because I've seen stories of, you know, musicians kind of locking themselves in studios and just cranking stuff out or, um, you know, authors cranking different things out. Um, I think it has. I mean, I, for me, it's, and I don't know if this is a creativity thing or not. I mean, I, but, you know, to first and foremost to have done 44, whatever it is, 44 interviews over the last um, eight, nine weeks was not anything I ever expected. And then the creative side is just, is just kind of trying to find those little nuggets of content, you know, and how to share them with them and, and, and start sharing them in different ways. Um, but it has, I mean, it's, my content's totally different. It, uh, this is interesting, at least to me, but um, and, and there might be some people in the crowd that are in our audience right now that were there. I, the final two speeches that I did in person were on February 27th. One was to a group of executives, and we did it at AMC Theater that morning about championship culture. Same speech delivered that night to a bunch of electricians. So yeah, one group that was, you know, business attire, the other jeans and t-shirts, um, different type of crowd message was the same um and it was it was big picture stuff and i wanted to use that speech virtually as soon as this started and i realized within one or two attempts at it that it just it just didn't fit and, and i had to come up with content even if the messaging was similar i had to come up with content that was about today because what i was hearing from everyone was the uncertainty and the fear. This was just a different time than what it was February 27th. Even if the big picture, uh, you know, themes were the same. Like, what am I gonna do today? So that that's led to some creativity and just thinking about it differently. I was always thinking big picture and now I'm really trying to think about the moment um, and I'll continue to do so. So it really has um, just my, my mind going every moment, you know, you hear, oh, wait, that would be good. Oh, that would be good. Let me pull that one in there. So. I have a question. Yes. I, you raised your hand too. I did. <laughs> um, okay. I, you probably watched The Last Dance and you know, since I'm so sporty, I watched it as well. Yes. And there they said that Michael Jordan's, um, one of his biggest reasons for success was because he never thought about the big picture. He, he had that about like, capability to just sit in the moment what do you think is like the pluses and minuses of both and which way do you see yourself going post-pandemic yeah great question Aaron and and by the way I don't buy for a second that Jordan didn't think big picture I mean he 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 was I, I just think he had the ability to think big picture while being so laser focused on the moment so he could do both and maybe the best ones can and he was the best and by the way, interesting, because there's been so much talk now about, boy, I, would you want to work with a guy like Jordan? What a bully and blah, blah, blah. Please, give me a break. You, 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 wanna, you, wanna, you don't want to work with someone that will elevate you to the top and bring the best out of you. Every one of those players that took crap from him then would tell you that it made them better today. One. Um, asked this question yesterday to Hunter Dozier uh, of the Royals. Uh, you know, Hunter's, I think, 27, 28 years old. Would you, want to, would you want to have played with Jordan and taken that abuse? He goes, in a heartbeat. In a heartbeat. And maybe not everybody, but I, I, I don't buy it. He, he's, he's the greatest of all time, and not just in terms of basketball, in terms of branding. There, 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 you name me anybody that, could, that, that has his name appeal, even to this day with the shoes that could go anywhere in the world like him and, and get the attention that he got then and now. I mean, it's still to this day is there. This, 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 for all I know, he agreed to let this project happen and he had that say, knowing 
that even if it made him look bad in some ways, that it would blow everything up even more. I, I, I think he can do today and big picture. One of the things that I've said in, in my presentation, I, I, I use the expression, um, it's, it's about timely over timeless. But the good ones, I say, can still have that, that view from 30,000 feet, or they can look out on the horizon and almost feel like you're putting on bifocals and looking at today. Or what have been your experiences with ball clubs sacrificing uh, or putting culture at risk uh, for talent? Yeah, I, I love this question. And I'm sure there are different takes on it. I'm, I'm not going to sit there and tell you that Dayton Moore is a mentor per se, although, uh, because I don't technically even work for Dayton, but I, I've spent so much time around him that whether he intended to or not, he has mentored me. And I can't tell you how many times he has told me that you never take a day off from your culture. I mean, I, I said before that, that the best companies that are thriving right now or surviving um, and I think that there's there's something to to um, survival right now that 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 does mean you're thriving because um, you're hanging in there. Um, and the best ones already had that culture figured out. I already said you can't just build a culture on the fly. It's a it's a long term thing. So to answer your question, Frank, I'll, I'll think about this one forever. I remember it's probably been oh it's probably been eight years now. This was pre 2014 and 15 and the Royals winning. And I remember at spring training one year, a guy on the backfield, I know the name, the name won't mention anything, uh, meant, uh, mean anything to anyone, I don't think. And so this guy had been in the game forever. And here he is in uniform helping out. He says to me, I've been with a lot of teams, I've been with a lot of organizations. He said, I'm in all the meetings, you know, in the off season with Dayton and the Royals. He said, everywhere I've ever gone, they set out this big master plan. We're going to do this, and these are our values, and this, and this, and this. And then after two years, it doesn't work. And they just pick it up and try something new. He says, I've never worked for an organization or someone like Dayton that continues to stick to what he said he was going to do. That doesn't mean you don't adjust. We, we always have to make adjustments. He says, they haven't changed their identity. They haven't changed their culture. They've stuck to it the whole way. He said, and this is going to pay off. And shortly after that, you know, they won in 14 and 15. And so then to further answer that question, and I've been telling this to people, I mean, my speech in the off season was how to handle the tough times, you know, how to, how to navigate the tough times. I didn't mean pandemic times. Uh, and that was a change that I had to make in, in looking at today. But it was, hey, when you're having a down year or a down quarter or, or, uh, or whatever it is, let, let's say the Royals have lost 100 games back to back years. How do you push through that? And the answer to me was, was culture. And, and the reason why the Royals will be competitive and back in the mix, no guarantees they'll win it all again, much sooner than others is that they will stick to who they are and they'll stick to that culture. And, and that, by the way, comes with new ownership and a new manager. What's the constant? The general manager, Dayton Moore. The, the one thing that, that I know Whenever they sign a new player, this, so this is what we do in my business. You, you, you sign or trade for a new player. The guy comes from Pittsburgh. I pick up the phone and call the, the, the version of me in Pittsburgh. His name's Robbie. Or, you know, you get a guy from, um, you know, from, from Los Angeles. Um, you know, I call the lady there that does what I do. Hey, what, what are they like? Anytime that we get a new player, I can predict what they're going to be like team player now, they're, they're, now some are loud some are quiet some are this some are that some are different backgrounds but they all they all fit the culture so the, the, that that is what will enable the royals to um has enabled the royals to push through the last couple of years you, you know okay so yeah any story related to dating taking messy action before the um and i you know i never heard the messy action thing from from Dayton. i i'd be interested to hear his at least take on, on that expression. Um, I actually got that expression from my marketing manager, Danielle Welsh, who, and, and that really not only did it go into my content, but it really, um, it really motivated me because um, it would be so easy to say, well, I can't be on TV right now. So what can I do? And um, I'm, 
I, I might've mentioned this before. I mean, I'm sitting in a walk-in closet here and, you know, I mean, if I'm giving away my secrets, I mean, it, you know, it's a, it's a backdrop behind me. Um, it's, it, you know, it's, it's a light, it's a computer, it's a nice microphone. That's it. Um, and I think it works. Um, and guess what? There's been some days where the Wi-Fi wasn't as good and it didn't look as good and um, the world went on. Everything was fine. Um, that to me, Dayton Moore's challenge was interesting because he he had to he had to sell what he was trying to do to a fan base and even an organization that had no reason to believe it. Like, here's the next guy coming in here saying we're going to change everything. Well, we heard that from the last one, the one before, and the one before. And, oh, by the way, it's going to take eight years. So there's a little bit of, you know, the I don't want to call it the PR game, but how do you sell eight years when people have been waiting for, like, 20? So, you know, you had to give people some hope and promise um, and try to be as transparent as possible. Um but I think that now, this second time through, I mean, again, I'll get back to the culture is already there. I don't know that you could sell the average fan on that, but what you could sell fans on now is, and, and I don't hear him saying this, but this group has done it before. So I, I do think that there is a belief, not just in Dayton Moore and their management team, but I think in Kansas City, there's an understanding of what winning looks like because we saw it now. I mean, you know, when they, when they won in 15, there was a whole generation of fans that had never seen it in their whole lifetime. So you're trying to sell me something that sounds really awesome, but I don't even know what it looks like. So now everybody knows what it looks like. I think it's a little bit easier to, to believe in that. Well, I think this was awesome, Joe. I, uh, yeah, we've got a, a good clap there from Adam. It, uh, I learned a lot. I always do every time we get a chance to talk, it's, uh, it's awesome the the things you have done to uh, bring the sports world and the business world together and, and weave those stories and, and make them actionable. And uh, and I know I always get a lot out of it. Um, it's great to see all you guys. Um, if I could help you in any way, whatever that might be, um, I'm, I'm, that's not necessarily in a speech, but if you want to bounce any ideas off or whatever it is, please reach out. Yeah. All right, everyone have a great weekend. Thanks, Joel. Bye. Thank you, Randy. Bye-bye. Thanks, Randy. Thanks, Randy. Thanks, Randy. Thanks, Randy. Thanks, Randy. Thanks, Randy.